Brian Rust versus Ricard Raquel. Sounds like fodder for a hockey thesis in the offseason. Which player would you keep? Which would you let go? Do you try hard to keep both of them? Are they even feasible? What other factors are in that? And I have a feeling that this decision, if it comes down to that, is pretty much going to be made for the management. Good morning to you. Good Thursday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates where you found this. There are as many significant unrestricted free agents facing Pittsburgh's management as really any point in franchise history. I mean, look at the names we're talking about between Evgeny Malkin, Chris Letang, the two players I've just mentioned, and others. And that, in and of itself, paints, well, a really unclear picture for what Ron Hextall and Brian Burke should do with any of these individuals. Because say, for example, that Latang, just focusing on Latang here, because I'm positive Geno's staying. I'm just 1,071% positive that he's staying. He has no wish to play somewhere else, and he's going to take a pay cut from the $9.5 million salary. And that's going to be plenty enough to get that done. But let's say that Latang is lost. Well, in that case, everybody's affordable because now you're throwing 7.25 million or 8 million or however much you'd offer him per year, and you're able to distribute that around the rest of the team, factoring in the additional 3.25 million that you'll save by letting Kasperi Kapanen walk. Now you're at 11 million, and you can keep everybody and try to get a right-handed defenseman somewhere. But I don't think that's going to happen either. As I've been saying all along, Latang should be the number one priority out of this group because they have no one who can come close to replacing him. It's not sentimentality. It's not break out the violins and the pianos. It's not keeping the core together and letting them retire happily. It's about performance and value. Latang remains one of the top, oh, how do I go about picking a number here? One of the top 15 or 20 defensemen in the league. I think we all can agree on that much. Given the ice time he absorbs, given the special teams that he covers, and those guys cost. Latang this past season at $7.25 million was the 18th highest paid defenseman. He's going to want to stay in that range, and I'm not sure I'd blame him for that. So supposing that he and Gino stay, and that's a safe supposition, the hardest decision is going to come down to Rust versus Raquel. There are other factors, but it's really going to be about those two. And if you ask me, it's going to end up leaning toward Raquel. This portion of Daily Shot of Penguins is brought to you by the good people at the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, where they're committed to providing food for all of our neighbors in need across western Pennsylvania. They, in turn, need your help. Find out how $1 can be turned into five full meals for those in need. Visit pittsburghfoodbank.org. Here's a little of what Rust said at the team's clean-out day a couple days ago in Cranberry, related to his future. But if you listen closely, you'll also hear him infuse how his past contract will influence these proceedings. Obviously, all those things are nice. You'd like to maximize everything. But um, I think for me, it's just getting to a point where I feel like I've got what I've earned and what what I'm worth. I feel like I've played to a higher level than what my contract said the last few years. And um, I think moving forward, uh, just getting something that's fair and I feel like can um, benefit me and my family moving forward. Let me do a little translation on that. 
When Rust is referring to what he's already been paid or his previous or existing contracts, what he's saying is he was underpaid and related to the production that he put out, being on the first line, first power play unit and everything else, he was. At four years and $14 million, Jim Rutherford got himself quite a steal. He correctly identified Rust and other guys along the way, most notably Jake Gensel, who's still getting $6 million a year for the foreseeable future. And believe you me, if Jake had ever hit the open market along the way, he would have blown that figure out of the water. But what Rust wants here, and I'm not saying this critically, but what he wants is to basically have a do-over of the previous contract. He's saying that he recognizes that he was underpaid and he's not complaining about it. He's not saying, boy, the Penguins really hosed me over because both parties happily signed that deal. I was there. No one was saying, oh, no, look at Rusty getting ripped off. He signed it. He honored it. He actually exceeded it. Good for him. And now he wants to have somebody somewhere pay him for past performance. I wouldn't push that concept in public too much if I were him. That's not something the teams like to hear on the outside. But if that's the case, then Rust is going to ask for more than the Penguins are going to be willing to give up, maybe more than they're able to give up, like for real. Because he's probably going to be looking at something that's in the range of around $6 million or more per year. And again, I, I don't have a problem with that. He's free to do that. That's the way the labor agreement rolls. You get one crack, and this is Rusty's last crack. He's 30 years old. There are teams out there that have the cap space. The Red Wings really stand out. He's from Michigan. We've already heard rumblings over the winter that the Red Wings would be among the hottest suitors. Well, hey, you gave up, if you're Hextall and Burke, quite a bit to pick up Raquel. And Raquel himself said, by the way, at the same clean-out day, that he'd be happy to stay in Pittsburgh. Um, I mean, it was a great experience for me. I think I've, I've learned a lot from a lot of great players, coaches here. And... Uh, I feel like this team has uh, had a lot of potential and uh, this is definitely a place I would like to come back to and uh, where I think that I can take my, my game to the next level as well. If you're managing hockey assets, not just the salary cap and not just the money, but all the hockey assets, the draft picks that you give up, the players that you give up, Zach Gaston Reese and Dominic Simone went out to Anaheim in that trade in addition to the draft picks, then you're ideally being a little careful about just throwing them away on a month or two of a nice player that maybe will be able to help you out in the playoffs and maybe won't. In this case, it was not Raquel's fault, but he really wasn't able to. I would lean and I would lean heavily toward preserving the asset I think Raquel brings a dimension that Russ doesn't have, and I am not at all finding it tasteful to say anything negative about Brian Rust. But Raquel's a different kind of player. Raquel's going to do more that's closer to the net. Raquel's going to be more dynamic in terms of how he approaches gaining the blue line, for example. We saw with our own eyes that Raquel and Sidney Crosby mesh. We don't have to wonder about who would be on the line with Sid and Jake. But like I said, this is going to just kind of play itself out for management. They're not going to have to wonder how this breaks down. When we come back, just one question. Today's J1Q comes from Ty, who asks, where does the team go from here? Is this it for Mike Sullivan? Is the Crosby, Malkin, Letang era over? How much change should we expect this offseason? And, 
you know, Ty, I'm reading this in a way that that I hope is respectful of what you're asking, which is very, very broad, obviously. And the safest, I think, smartest answer that I could give here is that we don't know because the setting has changed so much, principally at the very top. I could answer questions like this with lots of confidence and lots of information and lots of background in the past because I know Mario Lemieux, because I know Ron Burkle. I don't know Tom Werner and the Fenway Sports Group anywhere near as well. I've met Tom once, spoken to him twice, and that's it. That's it. I have no idea what he or they want to do. There's been all kinds of speculation already, but it's only that. It's only that. There's also been a look at other teams that they've operated, whether it's their soccer operation overseas or whether it's the Red Sox in Boston and whether it's just letting Mookie Betts walk, basically, to the Dodgers. Because they did, and it was seen as an outrageous move, not just in Boston, but across the baseball world. For those of you puckheads who don't follow baseball, Mookie Betts is really, really good, like potentially a generational player. And the Red Sox tried to engage him in what they thought was going to be a reasonable contract negotiation. They didn't like the way it was going, and poof, there he went. In a sport without a salary cap, I'll remind you, and with an ownership group that's got deep enough pockets to have handled a Mookie Betts contract. What does that mean toward this? I have no idea. I really don't. I have mentioned on this show that Werner visibly was intensely involved in all facets of this organization over the past few months. When I first saw him, and that, by the way, was back when I met him, about two weeks or so after the sale was complete, I thought to myself, oh, that's kind of cool that they came. You know, I wasn't sure if they'd even have somebody here. And Werner's not a kid. He's 70 years old. So you'd think like, you know, the dude's accomplished an awful lot in his life that he'd find something else, you know, kind of go sail somewhere on a boat and, you know, soak in the retirement. I'm thinking this is just kind of a, a for show thing. No. Never left, showed up at every game, sitting right there between Ron Hextall and Ryan Burke. Already made a change in a de facto kind of way at the CEO position by moving Kevin Acklin up the ladder and, you know, presiding quite possibly over the resignation of David Morehouse. Who knows? Who knows? Did they just need to see this? Meaning the fourth consecutive first round exit? Is that enough to say, hey, it's time to try something completely different? They do. They, meaning FSG, have a history of very much putting their imprint on things. The idea that I think a lot of us have had, and I had it myself certainly at the beginning, that they were just going to continue honoring Mario and Mario was going to be the owner, the de facto owner, even though he now owns probably, you know, less than 5%, if that much of the franchise. No, no. So we just don't know. And I'm not going to go on the speculation route the way that a lot of other people are comfortable doing. I'll report stuff as I see and hear it and share it with you. But, man, I would not expect nothing. Let's put it that way. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We'll do another one of these tomorrow. Tomorrow.